So tonight we are going to continue our discussion uh, and for the love of God, the gospel of the kingdom. And the, the reason that we're going through this is this is a, really a foundational teaching to me, uh, but it's the gospel of the kingdom. And I distinguish that from the gospel of salvation because the gospel of salvation is all about you. It's what happens to get saved so that you can have eternal life. And it sort of ends at salvation. But the gospel of the kingdom sort of starts there and goes through because the gospel of the kingdom isn't about you getting saved. It's about him. It's about his purpose for you in his kingdom. And he is raising up a kingdom. And it's obvious now more than ever that we need his kingdom come and his will be done on the earth. So we need to understand the gospel of the kingdom. Because when those people out there decide they're going to come in here to find out what's going on because they know they've been lied to, they're confused, there's doubts, there's things going on out there that's, that's going to open up their eyes and they're going to come looking for the truth of the kingdom. Well, if this government's not working and the world government's not working, what government will work? Well, it just so happens the government that will work is the kingdom of God. And if we have the kingdom of God manifest through the people, then we'll see what government's all about. So it's going to be exciting, and I know that's going to happen, but we must understand the gospel of the kingdom. So we're going to continue on in that discussion here today. Now, this is actually part five. So we've had uh, four parts before this. Don't worry about it. They're all on video out there. So if you see something here you want to go back and look at, uh, then it's, it's going to be out there, and it is out there already. So for part five, it's called Religion or Relationship. So the key verse for this is Mark eleven thirteen, And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. So let's find out what that's all about. So I'm going to answer a couple of questions, like why did Jesus curse the fig tree? What do the fig leaves represent in the Bible? What's the difference between religion and relationship? And can a Christian still choose religion rather than relationship with God? A Christian. So let's get into it and take a look at this. So where do you think we want to start? Where do I always start, right? Let's go back to the beginning. Why? Because you remember principle one, which I had from day one which was God declares the end from the beginning. So in the beginning is God's purpose. And so we found out that the, the, the Bible starts with a wedding and it sort of ends with a wedding. It starts with Babylon and it ends with Babylon. So there's the true bride and the false bride. And we're learning what the purpose of creation is. And that was in the first lesson. So we always go back and take a look at what was God's purpose. So let's start with Genesis 2.25. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So we're talking about a relationship between man and woman here and man and woman and God. So the three of them. And what kind of relationship was it? I'll give you a hint. They were naked and there was no shame. Would you call it an intimate relationship? Because in an intimate relationship, clothes aren't really an issue. You, you want to be as close as you can. You want to be as open as you can to each other because you love one another. And that's a truly intimate relationship between uh, Adam and Eve and God. So there was an intimate relationship at the time. But something happened. Uh, spoiler alert. Uh, so we moved to Genesis 3 and we learned that they ate of the wrong tree. And let's just take it from there. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. So what's happened here? Well, what's happened, of course, is that, and we'll cover this in another lesson, that as they, their eyes were opened, they realized that they were naked and they became ashamed. And you know what happens when shame comes in a relationship. All of a sudden, you, you, what do you do? Well, you start covering up, and that's what happened. So they went, and they sewed fig leaves together. Now, what part do you think they covered? Maybe because of the sun, they made hat? 
right? Maybe they made, that was, or maybe for their feet to protect them, they made shoes. You think that's what it was? No, they covered their intimacy. They covered their intimate parts. Uh, you know, we talked about last week the, the, the new temple and that we are the new temple. So remember, the body has the different parts like the outer court and the inner court. And then, of course, you know, the, the holy place and the holy of holies. Well, this would be the inner court of the body is what's covered. And so something happened here. But they sewed fig leaves together. Now, was that okay with God? Well, let's look at Genesis 3.21. Then Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So why would God have done that? Could it be that the fig leaves were not an acceptable covering? So they ended up with garments of skin. So you think an animal might have just said, here, bar, you can borrow my coat? No. No, well, how do you think they got the skin for the garment? Maybe they sacrificed an animal? So can you see that God said, no, your own coverings are not adequate. Let me cover you. So what does that mean? Well, let's look. It's Isaiah 64, 6. For all of us become like one who is unclean, and our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf. I wonder what kind of leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. So, if we look at this, what do we think that the covering represents? How about righteousness? So, in the Bible, clothing represents righteousness. So, what are we saying here? We're saying that man's own righteousness was not sufficient to cover him. But God needed a sacrifice for his own righteousness. It's interesting because if we look at Isaiah 64, 6, does it say our evil deeds are like a filthy garment? What does it say? Our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. So how many people met the criteria here? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So all are de righteous deeds. So our righteous deeds don't even make the standard. So what are our righteous deeds? I'll give you a hint. This is my definition now. I'm defining religion as fig leaves. Anything you do to cover your own guilt or shame. It's our righteous deeds. But they're our righteousness, not his. You see the problem here. So we'll say that fig leaves represent religion. Fair enough? So let's go on and see how this fits. Let's look uh, in Matthew 3, 7 through 10, John the Baptist. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Now, so, first of all, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees went out to see John the Baptist. Now, why do you think they did? You think they went out to be baptized? Well, they didn't go out to be baptized because that would assume that they need what? That they need repentance because they've done something wrong. So, do you think they thought they'd done something wrong? So, therefore, they did not produce fruit in keeping with repentance, did they? So... You remember that we talked about the two trees and the significance of the two trees, right? The two trees in the garden, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, we said that the tree of life was the God kind and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil became mankind. So which one is going to produce the fruit of God? The mankind or the God kind? So to be able to produce the fruit of God, you've got to be attached to the God kind because you reproduce after your own kind. Principle 2, Genesis 1.11. So do not think we can say to ourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees. Gee, I wonder what tree. And every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So that good fruit is the question. What kind of fruit do you think that is? Man fruit? 
or God fruit. See, that's the situation. All our righteous deeds are as filthy rags. Let's look at Mark 11, the story. Let's see what Jesus had to say. So Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. Now, didn't we talk about the new covenant temple? Remember, what was the purpose of a temple? Anybody remember there were two things that we said? A place to meet with God, right? That was probably the key. And a place for God to dwell. Isn't that what the temple was? So that was the old covenant temple that was produced because mankind lost his bodily temple in the Garden of Eden, right? So if we look at this thing and we know that the temple that in the new covenant, we have returned as the temple, right? So he entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. So what are we saying about this? Jesus came where? To us. And after looking around, he departed for Bethany. Now, Bethany, by the way, the word Bethany means house of figs, as opposed to fig leaves. This is fruit. With the twelve, since it was already late. And on the next day, when he had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at the distance a fig tree, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. So, first of all, he became hungry. What do you think he was hungry for? Why don't, we, why don't we see what he said? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. So, do you think he found the fruit of righteousness on that tree? But what did he find? Nothing but fig leaves. Man's righteousness. See the problem? They weren't producing the fruit of God. For it wasn't the season for figs, but the good news is maybe the season will change. And he answered and said, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. So what do you think? You think Jesus just was walking by and he's, uh, I've always hated that fig tree. And I'd always go over there and it never has any food. So I just got mad at the, uh, don't cur curse the fig tree. No, there's a principle here. When Jesus did something, uh, it meant something. There was prophetic meaning in virtually everything in the Bible. It's not prophecies 30% of the Bible. Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Everything he did is prophetic. So we know that there is the significance here. So let's take a look what, where he went from there. Next verse. And they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple. Excuse me. And be, oh, this is the same thing. He began to cast out. And so he went to the temple now. He, he'd already gone to the fig tree. He cursed the fig tree. And now he goes in. And he now goes back to the temple. He entered the temple and he began to cast out those who were buying and selling. And by the way, that word cast out there is ekbalo, which happens to be exactly the same term of casting out a demon. To drive out, to cast out. So what are we saying here? He entered the temple and began to cast out demons, basically. So, but do you realize how different that was? How many demons do you know they got cast out in the Old Testament? Hey, if someone had a demon, what did they do with them? Yeah, they killed them. I mean, it wasn't the devil who killed all those people in the wilderness, you know. It was God. Because there was no separation of the sin from the person. They were the same. But Jesus now casts the devil out of the temple, of us. So he's talking about separation. And, and surely, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come. And so this is the kingdom of God being manifest. So he's casting out all who were buying and selling in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So what do you think they're doing here selling doves? Uh, obviously, dove sandwich for lunch. You think it's for the, like a food truck kind of thing where you, you roll it up and sacrifice. Oh, that's what it was about. They were selling sacrifices. <clears throat> hmm. You know, I wonder what that looked like. You ever think about that? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, maybe the way you do it is you just set this booth up and what, what, why don't we call it um, 
uh, confession. How's that? We set up a booth and we call it confession. And so people come in and they say, you know, here's what I did and did this and did this and did this. And you can just sit there and say, oh, gosh, that's a cow and that's, gee, that's, you know, three doves and maybe a sheep. That'll be this much money. They were selling sacrifices. They were profiting off of the sin of the people. My God, can you imagine that? Not that we would ever do that now. Do you see the problem? Do you see the situation? I mean, there are situations if you, if you convince somebody they're bad enough, and sometimes you can do an altar call and they can come down and you'll pray for them and they'll be fine and just write the check and they'll be fine because now you're absolved. See, see the problem. See, that's religion. That's what he came to cast out. So they're selling these doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a robber's den. Gosh, that was terrible back then, but luckily we don't do that now, do we? So would you say that the selling of doves and all that is all about religion, but prayer is about relationship with him? And do you realize we're that temple? So our temple is not about religion. It's about relationship with him. So let's look how this really works. Continuing on. And the chief priests and scribes heard this and be began to ask him how they could do that so that they would understand this because they wanted to be blessed too. Is that what it says? No. no. Uh, re remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? when Cain and Abel were there and Abel's sacrifice was accepted because he offered a, up like a lamb and all of a sudden uh, Abel offered the work of his hands and it just wasn't acceptable. Now, you remember God came to him and said, hey, what's the problem here? You know, you, if, if, if you do well, you'll be blessed. If you do poorly, well, not so much. So that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil they were on. So what did it produce in Abel? Did he come up to, to um, Cain, did, excuse me, Cain? Did Cain come up to Abel and say, well, gee, I, you see, your offering was accepted. Brother, I love you very much, and I'm, will you show me how to do that so we can both be blessed? So what happened? No, because that tree didn't do that. Well, what do we see here? What does religion produce? Right here it shows you. And the chief priests and scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him. Sound familiar? And they were afraid of him, and all the multitude was astonished at his teaching. And whenever evening came, they would go out of the city. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from roots up. Do you understand what happened here? Let's go back to Matthew 3.10. The axe is at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. You see the situation here? Nothing but leaves. Big leaves. That's what the church was producing. That's a problem. But we look at that and we blame that maybe the, the Jews didn't get it, right? But do you really think we're doing that much better? Let's take a look. Jesus said it this way, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So here's our two trees, right? Which one is Jesus? He's the tree of life, right? Because if you eat of the tree of life, you live forever. So that's Jesus. He restored the tree of life. So he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. But notice verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. They gather them up and cast them into the fire and are burned. So let me ask you what that means, because remember, salvation is about getting him into us, isn't it? But he says, yes, I in him, but also he in me. So it's not just about getting God into us. It's about getting us into him. And that's, and so is it possible that you could have him in you? But if you don't go into him, isn't that what it says? 
if anyone does not abide in me, he didn't say they didn't, that he wasn't in them. He said, if you choose not to abide in me, then you're not connected into the tree of life. You're on the wrong tree. You see the problem. You cannot produce the, the fruit of God from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the law. By definition, isn't the knowledge of good and evil the law? Didn't 4,000 years prove that? Isn't that what Jesus saw, 4,000 years of fig tree? And what did it produce? Nothing but leaves. The fruit was not there. So let's look on. So let's go back to our diagram on the new temple. Remember, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So here's the clever diagram here that shows the Old Covenant Temple and the New Covenant Temple. And the, notice that they compare nicely. That we have the inner court, which remember is the sort of the uh, inner court of the body. That's the part they covered with fig leaves. And then the soul is the holy place. And your spirit is the holy of holies. We learned that, right? That, the, that in the old, that when we lost it in the New Covenant Temple... We had to have an, uh, an old covenant temple to put the spirit in. So this is a picture of what we learned there. So if you want to go back and read about the new temple, I've got it as one of the messages, and I'll go through in detail. But John 3 says it this way. Imagine that we are not saved. What does it look like? Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Because that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So that's why I say the word water here represents the flesh birth, because it defines it in the next verse. So you must be born of the flesh, because if you're born of the flesh here in the United States, what does that make you? A citizen of the United States. So if you are born in the spirit, what does that make you? A citizen of the kingdom. So, but you understand what had happened. They lost the whole, this Holy Spirit in the Garden of Eden. So they didn't have their citizenship in heaven. So now they're without the spirit. And they're just stuck on this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the law. So what are we going to do? Because the law says you're not, you're not good enough. So how's God even going to communicate? Well, they come up with fig leaves, of course. Religion, right? Every, the things that you do righteous to make you feel good to cover the, your own sin. The good works. So can you see the parallel here? So... Let's go back to Romans now, Romans 7. Now, Romans 7 and 8 are very, very difficult passages theoretically, but if you understand this, they make total sense. So I'm just going to take a verse out of each. Chapter 7. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Okay. Now, why would he call it a body of death? Because he's made up of body, soul, and spirit. Another word for body is the flesh, right? So... Remember, he's on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what's his problem? He's stuck with the concept of sin and death. If you eat of this tree, you will die, right? What's that death? You sin, you die. Separation. That's the concept. Because on that tree, you're judged by your, what you do, not who you are. It's a performance-based tree, as we learned in the two trees. It's not based upon your identity. It's based upon your performance. So if you sin, you get rejected. If you do well, okay, we'll accept you. But and how many people were raised on that tree? Unfortunately. So you see the problem here. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Because we know that sin dwells in the flesh. How, how are you going to do it? When you only have that choice, the soul is being influenced constantly by the flesh. Because remember, the eyes of the flesh were opened in the Garden of Eden. That contact between soul and body. But luckily, we go to Romans 8. But if Christ is in you, your body is dead still because of sin, but your spirit is alive because of righteousness. 
So can you see the two trees here? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. See, here's the problem. We think that when you get saved and now that you've got the Holy Spirit, that's it. You've made your one choice and you're in and everything's good, right? But what's the problem? The problem is, it says, your body is still dead because of sin. You still have the two. Did Adam and Eve have a choice? They did, didn't they? So you see, that choice is still there. If you think you've made the choice just by, now I'm saved because I've said the prayer and I've got the Spirit in me, remember? Yes, I in you and you in me. And if you do not remain in me, you see the problem. We've got a choice to make. So where are you in this picture? Right in the middle. You are the mind, will, and emotions. That's you. That's who you are. So here's your soul stuck in the middle, needing to make a choice between the flesh, the body, and the spirit. And so you have to make those choices. And how often do you make those choices? Well, let me give you a hint. If, 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 say a man and a woman want to get married. They say, okay, our goal is we want to have a wedding. So the, the man and the woman, they get together and they have this wedding. But about three years later, she says, look, everything's the same before, as it was before we got married, and you never tell me you love me. He says, well, yeah, I told you back when we did the wedding. If it changed, I'll let you know. <laughs> I mean, do you see the problem? That's what salvation's like. You have the wedding, but you don't have the marriage. So how often do you need to be submitted to the Spirit? Is, is once enough? No, because a wedding's not enough. You need a marriage, a relationship. Remember? Depart from me, I never knew you. Remember in our two trees, this is just one of our slides, we looked at the different dimensions of these two trees to explain that the, that the same choice is throughout the Bible, all the way from the Garden of Eden, all the way into the Revelation. And that these trees are multidimensional. They have different dimensions just like we do. I got a certain height, a certain weight, you know, I, I speak a certain way, I do this, I do that. All those things are different dimensions. So we learned that these trees have a lot of different dimensions, and the Bible is full of all these dimensions all the way from the beginning to the end. But they, they link together in the Bible by the words that he gives us. And so we derived just a few of them to show that what these trees represent. See, the trees aren't the tree of good and bad or the tree of right and wrong. They're two different trees, but the choice is not good or bad or right or wrong. Remember, your righteous deeds still aren't good enough. It's not about that. So here's the, some of these choices that we talked about. And we, we even picked Galatians 5, 19 and 22. The deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality. And if you want to know the rest, turn your TV on because they're all there. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc. And if you want to know the rest of those... Any one of us should be demonstrating those, right? Because that's the true fruit of the Spirit. So this is the two trees. That's your choice. But do you see now that that choice is made from the soul inside your own body? Whether you're going to follow the flesh or you're going to follow the Spirit. Let's go back to John 15. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me bears much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch. So now, does it make sense how that choice is made? Are you going to walk by the flesh or walk by the spirit? That's your two trees. Are you going to walk by self-righteousness, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is performance-based? It's what you do, right? I mean, if you get, you get thrown into jail under the law, you get thrown in, not for what you thought, but what you did. Because the knowledge of good and evil, it, it judges your actions, which are from the flesh. But that's not the tree of life. The tree of life is identity-based. Uh, you are my son, in whom I'm well pleased. 
What? I'm well pleased because you did something right? No, you're, I'm well pleased because you're my son. That's an identity statement. So can you see that there's two trees and we make those choices in our relationships all the time to be, have an identity-based relationship or a performance-based relationship. And unfortunately, a lot of us had moments where we were raised on the wrong tree. If you do poorly, you're rejected. If you do well, then we bless you. Wrong tree. Galatians 5, here's the sad thing. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision. This is, by the way, in the Bible, probably in yours too. But a lot of people, you'd never see it if you, you know, at the church. No one preaches on this one. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision. In other words, who puts themselves under the law. For he's under obligation to keep the whole law. You have been severed from Christ. You are seeking to be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. So can you see here that the term fallen from grace doesn't mean you screwed up? As a matter of fact, you probably did something righteous. Fallen from grace means that you've chose to justify yourself by your actions instead of his. his right, your righteousness instead of his righteousness. So you've fallen from grace. We always say, fallen from grace, they did something wrong. No, you probably did something right, and that's what made you fall from grace, because you said, look at what I did, instead of, look at him. Sure enough, you put yourself under the, nothing but leaves. <laughs> Throw another cow on the fire. Do your own. That's what it's going to take. Make you righteous. Do your own thing. Your own sacrifice. Christianity is full of it. Can you see that? Matter of fact, we actually see this in a, this is from a, uh, uh, a florist. Exactly how mad is she? See, it's, um, you, you see what we're talking about here. It's, do you see the religion here? It's a sacrifice. I, I'll make this sacrifice because I did something wrong. Exactly. How bad is it? Oh, that's, a, it that's at least a cow. <laughs> Maybe two doves, you know. I mean, do you see the situation that we live under? we got to get, that's the wrong tree. And if they're teaching you that in your church, we've got a problem. It works. You can improve performance under that very often, at least in the short run, by holding, by get, blessing people for their performance. Yeah, you can get your kids to get a better grade. You can do lots of things by by putting pressure, but, re, but the problem is that you can still um, discipline under the tree of life, but you don't do it by withholding your approval for that person. See, when you, when you put the approval based upon condition, you're under the law now. You know, if you did something wrong, you don't get the wafer because you're not holy anymore and God doesn't accept you. Is that a good message? You're still my son. It, 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 this is really fairly simple. I don't know how we've got it so screwed up. For the law, since it's only a shadow of the good things to come, not the very form can never, by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. That's why Moses couldn't lead the people in the promised land. Because Moses represents the law, and the law can never get you across the Jordan. Only Yeshua, Joshua, Jesus, can get you there. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse, so choose life, in order that you may live, you and your descendants, by loving the Lord your God. So why did Jesus curse the fig tree? There was no fruit on it. Religion cannot produce the fruit of righteousness. What do the fig trees, what do fig leaves represent in the Bible? Religion. 
the things that we do to cover our own shame. What's the difference between religion and relationship? Well, it's the difference between your self-righteousness and submitting to his righteousness. It's, it's a difference between justifying yourself or being justified in your relationship with him. Can a Christian still choose religion rather than relationship with God? Yeah, every day. Every day. Well, next week, we're going to be talking about one bad apple. Why do you think I call it one bad apple? Because one bad apple does what? You got it. <laughs> and my scripture will be Genesis 3, 5, and you will be like God. <laughs> yeah, like God. Huh? So what happened when Adam and Eve ate the wrong tree? Why did they do it? What causes shame and what causes blame? Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Father, for your gospel of your truth. Lord, I thank you for the revelation, Lord, and I ask you just to touch each one here and, and have them receive, Father, the truth of what you really want. Let us understand, Lord, that religion cannot produce love. It only kills it. But relationship is what you're looking for, Lord, because you want to be loved, and that demands a choice. Lord, help us to understand that choice. We thank you, Father, for revealing that to us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all.